Thank you. Hello, everybody. Well, it really is a huge honour to be asked to speak to you today. And the talks we've heard so far have just been absolutely amazing. I feel incredibly humbled, and I can't imagine what useful things I've got to share with you, but we'll have a go. Okay, so I'm the head of, as we've heard, of nursing, midwifery and social work at the University of Manchester. And I'm very proud to be that because um, the department here at Manchester was the first university department of nursing in the country. Uh, it's quite a large department. We've got about 200 staff, about 1,200 undergraduate students and about 370 postgraduate students and 58 PhD students. So it's a large department, and my job as head of that department is partly to balance the books, make sure that we um, make enough money to keep running, partly to have um, a strategic direction for where we want the department to go, what's the research we should be doing in the future, what's the teaching we should be developing that's going to be needed by the NHS and social care in five years or in ten years, um, and just really, you know, giving direction to teaching and research in what is a very large university and a very successful university. So, you know, we can't really um, drop the plates on my watch. So it feels like a huge, a huge weight of responsibility. So I graduated with my PhD uh, about 30 years ago. So that's not yesterday, it's quite, you know, it, it feels like maybe the day before yesterday, but it really is a long time ago. I think I'm certainly the oldest person speaking to you today, apart from possibly Nancy uh, coming in via video a little bit later on. You know, I did my PhD, I typed my PhD at when computers were, were just coming in. The internet didn't exist when I was at university. That's how old I am. And I, and I was the first person in my family to go to university. I was brought up in Leeds um, by a single parent, by my father actually, he was a single parent, and he'd not gone to university. He'd done an engineering apprenticeship and, and been to night school. So um, this was all new to me. And I would very much say I'm an accidental academic. And this will come through, I think, in what I, in what I tell you. I'm an also an accidental nurse. Because although this picture of me age four suggests I always had a, a lifelong ambition to be a nurse, that's not strictly true. What I wanted to be was a vet. And I was crazy about animals all through my childhood, all through my teenage years, and what I wanted to be was a vet. And I did science A-levels, and I went to see the careers teacher whilst I was at school. Um, I, careers teachers have got a lot to answer for, I would say certainly from the old days, from the 70s in my case. So my careers teacher listened to my passion about wanting to do veterinary medicine. Well, here's some leaflets about nursing, is what I got from that interview. Not daunted, I carried on and still wanted to be a vet and applied, and I did get an offer from university to, be a vet, to do veterinary medicine, but didn't get the grades. I wasn't very studious as a teenager. And so my last um, chance was to do um, a course in Liverpool, which allowed me to qualify as a nurse and do a, do a science degree. So I didn't get a nursing degree. I got a nursing qualification and a science degree all over four and a half years, and I studied pharmacology. Now, um, why Liverpool? I mean, I, let's say when I got my A-level a results, I was devastated. Because although in my heart I knew I hadn't got the grades to do veterinary medicine, it's still at that point in time what I really wanted to do. And I was devastated. Picked myself up, went off to Liverpool, and had an absolutely great time. Picked Liverpool partly because the, the degree wasn't a nursing degree. I would always have had a science degree to fall back on if I, the nursing thing didn't work out. But also because I was a bit of a punk probably don't even know what a punk is, do you? But it was, a, it was a kind of music that was huge in the 70s and the early 80s. And I, I, I'm passionate about music now. I, I was then. I haven't changed in that regard. Liverpool had the most amazing, amazing music scene in the 70s and eight, early 80s. So that's mainly why I chose the University of Liverpool. I'm so shallow. So... Um, so I went there, and I wasn't a straight-A student. I failed some exams, 
I had, couldn't really work out what my direction was, where I was going. I only worked out, really, in the last six months of being at university, how to actually revise and study. It had all been a mystery to me up until that point. And then I suddenly got competitive, worked really hard last six months, managed to get a good degree, got a 2-1. Um, and so that was, you know, useful for the future, let's say, at the time. And quite finished, finished my nursing course. I loved nursing and I loved Liverpool. Uh, and so didn't feel I'd had a, had made a mistake at that point. So that's me um, after I'd qualified as a, as a staff nurse in vascular surgery at the Royal Liverpool Hospital. So far, so good. Except. Um, this was in the mid-80s. Margaret Thatcher was our Prime Minister at the time. The miners' strike was in full flow. And I don't know about you, for me as, a, as a, an English person, it's pretty depressing living here at the moment. It was very depressing living here in the mid-80s, I would say. Very depressing. Austerity was a thing in the mid-80s, like it is now. And the National Health Service felt very underfunded and as a newly qualified staff nurse with hardly any staff on the ward it was really really stressful so I would typically newly qualified nurse be in charge of the ward on vascular surgery patients have had their major arteries cut open sewn back together again bits of their arteries taken away new bits stuck in quite major stuff lots of things can go wrong and the patients would be coming back from the operating theatre and I'd be in charge just qualified myself with a, a couple of new, uh, student nurses on the ward to help me out who couldn't yet take blood pressures accurately and we were supposed to be monitoring everybody's condition as they came back from the operating theatre it was really quite stressful very understaffed I would go home dream I was still at work all night think people were dying around me because we hadn't measured the blood pressure accurately, get up at six o'clock the next morning, go back and do it again. And I was very rapidly burning out. So when I got a phone call from the department where I'd done my degree to say, we've got some money for a PhD, but we don't, don't have anyone to fill that that um, studentship. Could you, would you like to come back and do a PhD? It felt like a lifeline I was, um, you know, I could see an escape route from this really, really stressful situation. Never thought to actually ask, what is a PhD? What does that involve? Why am I doing this? I just saw it as an escape route. So, toddled off back to do a PhD. Now, um, what I did my PhD on, because it wasn't about me choosing a topic that got funding for a particular thing, but but it was something I was very interested in because my dad had been diabetic since he was 17 years old and he was on insulin injections two or three times a day, massively affected his life. And more than a third of people with diabetes get terrible nerve damage, which can result in amputations and all ki kinds of chronic wounds and ulcers on their feet and, and other things. And so this PhD was supposed to be about how, what happens to the nerves of people with diabetes which cause these long-term health problems. So really interesting. Why does the nerve damage happen? So I had a personal interest in the topic and it felt quite clinical, so that was good. I'm not going to dwell on the detail of this, but what I was doing was looking at the proteins that make up the skeleton, if you like, inside nerve cells. And I was looking to see what glucose, high levels of glucose, which is what people with diabetes have, do to these proteins that perhaps prevent everything happening properly within the nerve cell. And that involved taking proteins out of pig's brains, because that was the best way of getting loads of this protein. And taking proteins from pig's brains, unfortunately, required lots of trips to the abattoir. So what I learned from that was how to, be, how to develop resilience and be incredibly strong and determined because basically my first trip to the abattoir in witness, bearing in mind, obviously, I'd never been to an abattoir before, who has, um, just meant the blokes standing around in their wellies said, yeah, love, the pigs are over there, go help yourself. Now, 
I'd never extracted the brain from anything before. There's this massive pig hanging upside down, and I had to work out what the brain was, how to get it out, put it in my beaker, and go back to the lab. So that was stressful. What did I learn from doing a PhD? I learned that lab research was not for me. Um, I, it, was quite, it can be quite a solitary existence, and that's not really me. I learned that where my heart lay was doing research with patients and people. Um, and I also learned, well, I didn't like abattoirs. So that was a useful piece of information. I learned um, what makes a good PhD and what makes a good PhD supervisor and what makes a good research training. And I ma mainly learned that from watching people not do it very well. And coming back to some of the things that the, the other tremendous speakers have said, sometimes the most useful things come from quite bad experiences. And knowing that if I'm going to do this, or I won't do that again, or if, I was, if I'm going to do that myself, I won't do it that way. And that can be really, really useful. And I think you also develop enormous resilience from bad experiences, and they, that, that resilience can stand you in really good stead. So, got the PhD in, um, finished, finished studying for the PhD in 1988, and went off to do what I wanted to do, which was more human, less pig orientated research, um, and went to um, what was a Department of, Fe of Health funded, so the Government Department of Health funded a nursing practice research unit. Uh, at the University of Surrey, and that was a brilliant opportunity to make a transition from doing you know, research on subcellular proteins to doing research on whole people and health and the health of the population. Um, and so I started doing research on wound care, um, affect many, many people with long-term conditions and particularly older people, and can have a tremendously negative effect if you've got a big chronic wound that won't heal, a very negative effect on your quality of life. So that became my, my, new, my new passion. I had to learn, though, a whole different set of research methods that we'd never been taught when I'd been doing this very biomedical research. So it was a whole different world. But what did happen to me, I would say, for the first time in my life, is that I then had a vision of what I wanted to be, finally, and what I wanted to do. And I'm not a big person for quoting people, mainly because I can never remember quotes, but I came across this Steve Jobs quote when I was preparing this talk, and it absolutely spoke to how I found myself at that point in my life, which is, if you are working on something exciting that you really care about, you don't have to be pushed. The vision pulls you. And that was a sort of turning point for me where I realized what my passion was and what my vision was. And that was to do with nursing. Not a very glamorous profession, um, but really, really important. And I realized that nursing is actually a lot more complicated than most of us realize, a lot more technical than most of us realize. And actually, it took me by surprise to realize that critical scientific thinking is incredibly useful and needed by nursing. Not every nurse has to be a scientist, but probably every nurse has to be a critical thinker, actually. And, and having nurses who are scientists in the mix is tremendously helpful. Um, and those people with degrees, now that's nowadays all nurses qualify with a degree, who are research orientated, who maybe are scientists, are, surprise, surprise, still capable of being compassionate and humane. There's still a lot of rhetoric in the press and the media about, do we really need nurses to have degrees now? Do we really need to go, give them all this education? Probably the only profession out, profession out there where people still think we might be over-educating them. No, education is always a good thing, and nursing is complicated even more so nowadays, I would say. And what we can do in, in nursing research is develop nursing care so that it is even more effective and delivers safer patient care and better quality outcomes than nursing has, uh, has done before. So we can keep moving forward those frontiers. 
But when I qualified in the 80s, there was very little nursing research because nursing was such a new academic discipline. So there wasn't much in the way of good examples to look at. But around that time, around the late 18, 1980s, early 1990s, the NHS had itself realised it needed much better research to inform patient care. So there was this new thing called the NHS Research and Development Programme, where money was being put to fund research to answer the day-to-day -day challenges that we have in healthcare. That's not necessarily about biomedical research, it's not necessarily about finding brand new drugs, but it may be to do with how do we care for people better who've had a stroke? How do we give people better rehabilitation or heal wounds or manage um, operating theatres better? You know, those kinds of questions. We didn't have enough research about that. So I thought, yeah, this is where I'm going to go. And you, you meet people who have a big effect on your life. And I met this chap called um, Ian Chalmers. And he was an obstetrician working in Oxford who had um, developed, really, or taken a new method of reviewing research, reviewing all the research on a topic, doing this thing called a systematic review, which is basically a scientific summary of the evidence for a particular healthcare intervention. And he'd done this for pregnancy and childbirth, and he kept those reviews, him and his a team of volunteers really kept those reviews up to date. So if someone's having a baby, an obstetrician could go and say, what's the best, what's the best treatment for this? If this happens, what should we do? There's all the evidence that told them what to do. He then tried, on the back of the NHS R&D program, research and development program, uh, beginning in the 1990s, to do this for the whole of healthcare, not just for pregnancy and childbirth. So he started this thing called the UK Cochrane Centre, doing systematic reviews across healthcare. And I started to join this journey and, and do systematic reviews in wound care. Started doing them firstly in leg ulcers. Now, we, had, we started with a UK Cochrane Centre in Oxford. This rapidly became a global phenomenon. It's all across the world now, all parts of the world, all continents. Um, the Cochrane Wounds Group started in 1995. We've now published 156 systematic reviews of wound care, prevention, and treatment strategies, and they're all freely available on the internet. And then in the late, when did I, no, mid 1990s, I'd moved to the University of York, set up the Centre for Evidence Based Nursing at the University of York, set up the Cochrane Wounds Group started doing these reviews and realized, actually, this is brilliant. If we do these systematic reviews of research evidence in the area that we're interested in, doing those reviews enables us to find the gaps where the evidence, the research evidence doesn't exist, but where the research evidence is most needed. So then we started doing the research to fill those gaps. So then, you know, what I sort of see myself doing with many excellent colleagues is doing the research that gives nurses out there in clinical practice, you know, actionable research evidence that they can base their patient care on. And what we've always gone out of our way to do is research with the nurses that, we, that we're doing the research for, um, not for them. So um, I see research as a very democratic, inclusive process. It's not an elite thing, at least not the kind of research I do. So I work with district nurses. They come to me with their research questions about wound care. They're on the grant proposals that we get funded. And they're authors on our Lancet papers, on our BMJ papers, in the top, uh, top medical and healthcare journals. So they're proper partners in this endeavor. And then they use the research in their clinical practice because they've helped to make it. So I think that's really important. So that's been fantastic. In 2011, I came to the University of Manchester. I wanted new challenges. I came to Manchester because it's got a fantastic reputation as a university, and the nursing department, division as it is now, it was the school then, has got a world-leading reputation for nursing, midwifery and social work, and particularly its research as well as its teaching. But the other thing I love about the University of Manchester, and I think this is true 
almost probably whatever bit of the university you're in, is its contact with the community and with the people who are going to use the products of its teaching and research. And in my case, that means the very close partnerships with the National Health Service in Greater Manchester and social care. That's really imp important because we have to work together on preparing the professionals of the future and doing the research that's needed. So I was specifically asked to talk about this, even though it really does make me cringe. Um, but early in 2013, after I'd come to the University of Manchester, I got an envelope through the uh, post that said from the office of the Prime Minister on the outside of the envelope, and you immediately think, oh my God, what have I done? This is really, really frightening. I'm really worried, frightened to open this envelope. And what it was was a letter saying I had been nominated like several of my colleagues today, for a, an honour. Uh, in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2013, I was made a dame. And this, totally out of the blue, one of the things that the briefing for this talk asked me to do was, was tell you all, how do you get one of these? Well, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> uh, you know, because it's all quite, it's not secret, well, it is secretive, you don't know somebody's nominated you, and you don't really know who it was. So, um, you know, I'm sorry, I can't. I think you've just got to do your best and make a difference, is I think, and enjoy your life, is, is, is what I've done. But so this is me getting my damehood from William. I have the um, honour, really, uh, of being Prince William's first ever honour. So it was his first ceremony, and I was the first person up. So that was uh, da as daunting for him, probably, as it was for me. And he pinned, he pinned this medal on my, on my chest, and it immediately fell off onto the floor. And I was wearing these high shoes. I'd never wear high shoes. I can't walk in high shoes. So why I decided I'd wear them to Buckingham Palace is nobody's business. But I looked at this medal on the floor, and I was teetering on these shoes. And I thought, if I bend down to pick that up, I will literally fall over. So I sort of, you can see that guy in the background, that flunky there. I sort of looked appealingly at him, and he came and picked the medal up. Anyway. So that more or less brings us up to date. Just my final slide. Um, really. So what have I learned from all this that I can pass on to you? And I think there's some really consistent themes coming out of these talks, and I think that's wonderful because we're all very different, but there's some very similar themes that, that we can say. Firstly, I think things don't always go to plan, and some of the things that don't go to plan and that can be awful at the time can turn out often very much for the best. I was devastated not to be a vet. I would have hated it, I, you know, it would have been a disaster, and I, I sort of grew, outgrew the animal thing. I mean, I still quite like animals, but not to that extent. And I much prefer people, and so I'm really glad that I did end up uh, in nursing. Um, I think being a late developer is okay too, so I didn't really get it till my mid-twenties. I didn't, you know, I was just drifting along, doing things by accident. Some people don't get it till much later. That's all fine, I think. Um, I think luck has quite a lot to do with it. I think you've got to take advantage of the luck. But, you know, if I hadn't met certain people along the way, I'm not sure I'd be here now. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. I really strongly believe in finding your passion. Um, you, know, I, you know, you've got to love what you do. Life's very long. Working life is getting longer and longer. You've got to enjoy it. Otherwise, life would be very hard, I think. And as others have said, I don't think you have to follow your core discipline or what you did your degree in. You can reinvent yourself, and you can re reinvent yourself very successfully, and it, it can work out tremendously well. I mean, I, th I think one, the way that you, you, know, you get the most out of life um, and your career, and probably why some of us have got honours and all of you could get honours, is just making a difference. And it's much easier to do that if you're happy in your work and you really, you really enjoy it. So thank you very much.